so caring for people with HIV now and in the future, a clinician perspective. Uh, these are my declarations. I take money for talks from a number of people. I think my main declaration, of course, is, is that I live and work in England and recognise entirely that the healthcare systems we work in and the healthcare challenges we face will differ very much between countries. I mean, within England, there are very different challenges. The challenges in a place like London, where we have a lot of HIV clinics and we see sort of around about 45% of all people with HIV in England, our challenges are very different to those in other parts of the country where HIV is less prevalent and you've got much smaller <coughs> HIV clinics further apart. Also coming from a very specialist perspective, the UK is quite unique in that most outpatient HIV in terms of doctors is managed by sexual health doctors rather than infectious diseases physicians. So that's another place that we do differ. So I'm going to start with the past and my view on how HIV care has developed over the years based on that beginning, where we are now and some thoughts about the future. So when we think about HIV and we think about the first reports of what turned out to be HIV related immune suppression back in 1981 and in 1983 the CDC in the US came up with what got coined the 4H club the people who are at risk of AIDS labeling groups of people homosexuals haemophiliac haemophiliacs heroin addicts and Haitians and what that did is create a foundation of stigma and otherness that I think clearly still pervades today. Now, unfortunately, anything that's related to behaviours like having sex, heaven forfend, almost everyone in this room is breathing today because somebody had sex. But things that are associated with sex or drug use, or they just get labelled. And I think, although things have improved dramatically, there are still examples in every country, however progressive it is, and however open people are about living with HIV, there is still this stigma that persists. And it wasn't until 1987, of course, that the very first drug became available to treat HIV, AZT or Zidovudine. And then it wasn't until 96 that we had treatment that actually worked. And what that means is there was this 15 year period of learning about HIV, of myths being created, of misinformation being circulated, which means 15 years of people experiencing what would now be entirely avoidable opportunistic illness and death. It was an era when significant drug resistance was emerging because of these suboptimal therapies. And there are still people with significant resistance today because of the legacy of very inferior treatment we had access to back then. And of course, 15 years, and not just 15 years, it's continued of, of stigma and discrimination. And really what that meant is there weren't many people who wanted to manage HIV. It wasn't a condition that people were clambering to, to provide care for. Um, and this is a quote from Jane Bruton, who was a nurse at Chelsea and Westminster and was there at the very, very beginning. And this was a piece, there was, I don't know if, if it was popular outside the UK, but a television series called It's a Sin, which revisited the early days of the HIV epidemic and actually triggered a huge rise in HIV testing. There's a whole generation of people. You know, some of us lived through the very early days of HIV and some of the really quite frightening television adverts and campaigns of information. But there's a whole generation, of course, who, who didn't, who weren't alive in the 80s. And... It really opened up people's eyes and generated a lot of discussion. And I think for me, I was slightly surprised. I was thinking, oh, people know this, and they, they just don't. And to see an upswing in HIV tests because of a television program touching on those early days of HIV, I think was fantastic. But Jane describes the fact that how little sympathy or empathy there was. People, people were frightened. People weren't very nice to these dying people with a condition that nobody quite understood and everybody feared. And, and really, I think, certainly in the UK, I think it's fair to say sexual health is one of the specialties that's just a bit more open and a bit less traditional and a bit more kind. And I think really that's how that, that model of care for us started emerging. 
But what it did mean is that things were very, very specialist, because clearly managing these infections that nobody had seen. These, you know, in, in the UK, we haven't seen some of the conditions that people were presenting with. So you created these very, very specialist units. And so the legacy, I think, which still, again, certainly in the UK, persists today, is HIV care has remained in a bit of a bubble. And in many reasons, that's a good thing. But I do think it's becoming a barrier to us integrating. I think we've reached that point now where the challenges that are facing people with HIV related to ageing and polypharmacy and lots of things we're going to hear about today aren't necessarily best served in HIV services. And I think we will get there slowly. And I think in some parts of the world, that's already happening. You know, in parts of the world where primary care physicians provide HIV care, like Canada and Australia. And there are examples where things are a bit more integrated. But I think there are other examples, including the UK, where HIV care is still relatively fenced off. But of course, we need to think about what people prefer. You know, it's all well and good saying, well, we think that, you know, X, Y, Z would be better managed in this particular clinic. But of course, people's preference is important. And again, in this country, people can get their HIV care at any clinic they want. They can travel for four hours on a train, jump on a plane, they can go to the clinic next door. It doesn't matter. And I do think that that has contributed to the UK's generally pretty good HIV outcomes because people have that choice. And if they fear seeing people from their community in their given clinic, if they've got a job in a particular town and it's a real struggle to get to a clinic that shuts at five o'clock every day in their hometown, they have that flexibility to get their care wherever they like. And we know there's a big survey in the UK called Positive Voices, which interviews thousands of people living with HIV, a representative sample of the whole UK. And it's clear that people prefer their HIV care to their primary care. Now that survey has just recently been repeated and the results will be released on World AIDS Day this year. So make sure you have a look at that report. Although it's UK based, I think there are lessons in there that are important to us all. So where are we now? I mean, U equals U. And finally, even the World Health Organization has committed to saying zero. That was released at a big conference in July. They've been skirting around very low, negligible. But the WHO, if your viral load is less than 200, a zero risk of sexual transmission. We talk a lot about normal life expectancy. But I think we have to remind ourselves, firstly, is the fact that people with HIV are disproportionately impacted by negative predictors of health, all those sociodemographic factors, all the things that are very hard, if not impossible, to modify. So a normal life expectancy for people who acquire HIV may never have been quite as high as the general population for all of those health predictors that really got emphasised again during COVID when we saw the disparate outcomes um, you know, based on many, many different factors. But there's also the fact that when we talk about normal life expectancy, we must remember that that's not normally necessarily a life expectancy that's comorbidity free. So we know even with a normal life expectancy, people with HIV have fewer comorbidity free life years. And that has implications again for medical care, for screening and prescribing. We know that people with HIV experience disproportionate mental health issues. And of course, all of that with that overlay of continuing <coughs> stigma has a real impact on people's quality of life. And that was one of the things that came out very clearly from the last Positive Voices <coughs> survey, and I suspect may be similar in this one, is that people with HIV report a lower quality of life than the general population. Oh no, no, I forget that I had an emphasis on them. And you know, how do we get there? We got there thanks to the evolution of treatment. I mean, the fact that we can now offer people, most people, one pill once a day, even here in England where everyone thinks we're obsessed with cost, we are a little bit, we do prescribe a lot of single pills. And of course, most recently, the advent of injectable treatments. And so here in the UK, and I suspect this is similar for at least some of you, you know, we do provide that multidisciplinary care. It is specialist centre based. And it is immediate now. We can all argue about whether it's on the day of diagnosis or three days later or two weeks later. I think in a country like the UK, it genuinely doesn't make a difference. 
but we start people on treatment and it's lifelong. You know, maybe in 10 years time, we'll all be stood here talking about the fact that cure is finally entering clinics. I think that's unlikely, but at the moment we need to prepare people for lifelong therapy. And of course, other elements of care, certainly here, are provided by other specialties and by primary care and how you join all of that up isn't just a challenge for HIV care, it's a challenge for anyone with a long-term condition. Because people with long-term conditions, as they age, tend to acquire more long-term conditions. And how you decide which specialist is responsible for which bits of that care is, is a challenge that goes way beyond HIV. We do six monthly follow-up generally, I think that's pretty common now, but we also do six monthly prescribing, which I think is very important in terms of supporting adherence. And again, I think this will be a common thing for many people, the increasing sharing of health records, the digitalisation of, of healthcare records is, is something that I think can, can support joined up care, but we have a, a number of barriers, uh, not least some of the issues related to confidentiality for sexual health based services. But the problem we have is primary care, just, they just do not prescribe six months of treatment, there may be the odd exception. But in general, primary care will give two months at a time. And anybody who has tried to get a repeat prescription every two months will know that it's not necessarily that straightforward. And I don't know if it's been studied, but I strongly suspect that people with HIV have better adherence to their HIV meds than some of their other meds. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because they see the drugs as more important, although it's actually some evidence that shows that some people do. It's because they can't get their other meds. I saw someone recently who couldn't get his anticoagulant, who couldn't get his beta blocker, because he'd been trying and trying and trying. Now, in some practices it's seamless and it's easy, but in many it's not. And the idea of just dishing out two months of meds at a time may be entirely appropriate for some people and some conditions, but I would argue it's absolutely not appropriate for people who have other long-term conditions. I think it's patronising. <laughs> And I think the other thing, I don't want to be too pessimistic, so, you know, reaching zero, zero new HIV transmissions by 2030, it's a goal for everyone. We've got the HIV Action Plan here in England and we have lots of meetings about it and lots of fantastic documents about it and we like to sort of pat ourselves on the back about our success. And the figures in 2020, this is looking at new diagnoses of HIV in England, because this goes out from 2001 to 2020. And you can see the number of new HIV diagnoses was coming down and down and down. And this is all thanks to combination prevention and aren't we doing such a good job? So HIV testing, because of course HIV testing is that time that that's that point that you can either then enter the prevention cascade or if you're diagnosed with HIV the treatment cascade the testing pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, which we haven't had the best record of providing but we do provide it in sexual health services for free if you can get an appointment and HIV treatment of course and the impact of you equals you aren't we doing a great job but the difficulty is is as we had predicted I think everyone suspected that the impact of COVID would be an upswing in new HIV diagnoses because of lack of access to testing and lack of access to prevention. And although generally most countries did a pretty good job of maintaining treatment, there were of course some issues and difficulties. So that's combined to see an, an, an upswing in, in diagnoses. Actually, that's a 45% increase compared to 2020 which is really quite remarkable. 22% rise since last year. But what we are seeing, if you look at people who were born in the UK, it's a 6% increase. For people born outside the UK, it's a 45% increase. So although there is some impact of COVID, this is also related to migration. And I guess my question to all is, is it, is it similar for you? You don't necessarily have to answer this because it's first thing in the morning and you're sitting to learn, but you know, is it similar where you work? And I think my concern is when we are seeing an increase in new diagnoses, and we're also seeing different reasons for that, and there's an awful lot of political overlay, of course, when it comes to migration related issues, is, is this really the time to start dramatically changing how we deliver HIV care, which is what we're facing in England at the moment, because the way things are being funded, and I won't bore you with the details, are changing. And I think it's, it's really important to think about where we are and what is the best way to, to sort of manage ourselves through this. 
the other thing I think is hugely important is, is drug-drug interactions, of course. And, and generally, I think it's taken us a while to get there. I think we're probably in a position now where most GPs are actually really good, most primary care physicians are generally really good at managing drug-drug interactions. Not always, there's always examples, and God, we love to sort of go on about those and present them at conferences and go, can you believe this happened? But by and large, if anything, my experience is that people are reluctant to give steroid injections. That message has got in there so well that we often have people saying, is it okay to give a steroid injection? You're like, it's absolutely fine, they're on unboosted therapy. But I think generally things have got a little bit better. But thinking about how we communicate that and, yeah, I can see it. Four minutes and 25 seconds, we're good, we're good. And I just don't think you can talk about pharmacology without, again, emphasising the wonderful University of Liverpool website. And I think that's something to think about. If, if we sort of do move HIV out of specialist care, how do we make sure, I think HIV clinics are very good at saying to people, you know, what medication are you taking, do you know this interacts with that, be careful with that over-the-counter steroid nasal spray, whatever it is. <laughs> Can we be confident that non-specialist services will be as good at imparting that specialist information? I think that's something to consider. And I think one of the things we experience is, yeah, well, drug interactions happen across the board. Like, HIV is nothing special. We deal with drug interactions all the time, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, yes, with any condition, there's a risk with a drug interaction of increased levels and toxicity. There's a risk of reduced levels and loss of condition control. That's true for everything. But of course, you have to keep reminding people, HIV is unique. There is no other long-term condition where loss of condition control could result in transmission or resistance. So that does make HIV truly unique. And there is a bit of a sense sometimes in England that you know, HIV is a bit special and protected. But there are, I think, some very good reasons why it should be. And there are good reasons why running out of meds for a few days is simply not acceptable in the context of HIV care. And why avoidable drug-drug interactions are just not acceptable because of the harm that it can cause. So the future... I think you know, we, we have to accept that cure and vaccine are way, way, way off. So I think we're kind of where we're at with basically the tools we have now. I think we'll have longer acting versions of many, many drugs. But ultimately, I think we are still looking at people being on lifelong therapy, whether it's administered daily or every two months or every six months or hopefully every year if that is Latrovir implant goes back into development. But what we're facing, firstly, that map represent, represents the fact that we're going through a big reconfiguration of how HIV care is funded. But we, in particular, are facing a recruitment crisis. This is a, a poster abstract title from actually several years ago, because genitourinary medicine, the sexual health specialty that I'm trained in, as are most outpatient HIV doctors, we are facing a particular struggle for that specialty. But that's just part of it. There are workforce issues across the board for all of us, and it's not just doctors, of course. It's nurses, it's pharmacists, it's all sorts of allied health professionals. And I think that is a, a really significant problem. And I think the other thing is, is, is just balancing it, because we still need expertise in complex opportunistic infections and complex resistance, and we still need teams that can manage and support people experiencing stigma and discrimination, and that's of course where peer support and community-led services are absolutely critical. So you've got those kind of specialist HIV-focused elements, but at the same time you're dealing with a population that's ageing, polypharmacy, and the issues, we always talk about the medical issues related to ageing, is so much broader than that, of course. There's the social, financial, and the care, the residential and nursing care issues that are facing, irregardless of HIV, all of our ageing populations. And our chief medical officer has just released this very sobering report about just what a medical disaster we're facing because we're going to have older and older populations that often not living in urban parts of the country. It's the coastal and rural communities. And again, that's going to be same <coughs> in whichever country you reside. And I think coming back to HIV, certainly for us, I think we need to think much better about embedding the general principles of HIV care across all medical nursing and pharmacist training 
and condensing the expertise and the training in complex HIV care because I think we need to accept that the bulk of HIV care is going to be more generalist and therefore we need to condense and future-proof a very agile and very specialist multidisciplinary workforce to manage the more complex issues. An integrated long-term condition management is a sort of buzz phrase here, but thinking about HIV care being provided by other medical specialties and other services, and over time that need for specialist HIV input will decrease. Just as well, because we can't recruit any doctors to the specialty anyway. I will skip through these because I am now over time. But I just want to highlight this because I think sometimes when people say stigma isn't an issue anymore, this is just one example. So frozen section, do you know what a frozen section is? It's where you do histology during an operation. So someone's on the operating table and you take a sample and you go to the lab and it's a way to decide how extensive cancer surgery needs to be, for example. It's not particularly common, but this is Manchester University. This is a big university hospital, they've got a big HIV cohort, they won't even do those laboratory tests on people who are high risk, which is everyone with HIV, which is ridiculous because unless you're doing mandatory HIV testing on everybody having surgery, how do you even know the HIV status of the person having the same procedure who hasn't tested? And these types of things are difficult, but I tell you what, I know I'm overrunning slightly, but be all right. Well, I'll talk less in the Q&A. Where was I? There's no, no, no guideline globally except in New York that says U equals U for surgery. Nobody has done that. Now, we're never going to do a trial proving U equals U in surgery, but I think we can use our brains and extrapolate. So New York City guidelines do say in the context of a viral load below 200, there is no perioperative risk. So if someone stabs themselves with a scalpel, there is no risk. And that's what we're just starting to embark on here. So we are gonna develop a guideline. And for all the inquiries we get, like, is there a risk if you're embalming a body? Is there a risk? I got my Botox refused. I didn't, I clearly don't have Botox. But you know, all of these things, we're gonna try and bring all that together and extrapolate you equals you beyond sexual transmission and think about those occupational risks as well. So uh, just to finish, Towards zero, I've mentioned already, and you know, this is our HIV action plan for England and prevention, testing, retention in care, quality of life. But we also say things like this. So should we achieve our commitment to reach zero in new HIV transmissions by 2030, we'd become the first nation in the world to do so. And whilst we should be proud of our achievements, that kind of we're better than you rhetoric actually makes me really uncomfortable. I don't, I don't like it. And I think, well, I was there again. We are in a position where we are actively courting overseas workers. So I think it's impossible to prove. But anecdotally, many of the people we're seeing newly arriving in the UK, living with HIV already, and actually on treatment and virally suppressed and doing very well, they're coming to help support our understaffed health and care sector. And this is just one example of an agency that is deliberately targeting workers from Zimbabwe to come to the UK. And that's great because they are incredibly welcome and thank you for coming to work in this bloody nation. But then they're not being supported to access the healthcare that they should. They're not being given the information. So they're arriving at small clinics because this isn't so much based in our big cities. These are small HIV services where an additional 30 people with HIV might be a 20% increase in your patient population. And managing that can be really challenging. And it, it's, there was a piece actually in the national press because these people are being given promises that just aren't being fulfilled about pay and conditions. They're on zero hours contracts. And it's a really terrible situation, actually, that we it's basically glorified trafficking of healthcare workers in the UK. And I think this is probably something that's happening in other parts of the world. Um, and and it's, it's something that we need to be much better at managing and making sure that people who are arriving in the UK are being supported to access healthcare in a timely fashion. But of course we do all this, stealing workers from across the world while we're contributing less and less to the global fund. And you know what? We're not going to reach zero unless everywhere reaches zero. So this rhetoric of aren't we brilliant and we did it first, I think is actually slightly dangerous. So I'll finish there with my rant. 
Thank you for listening. There's my contact details. Most importantly, if you follow Flame and Dame on Instagram for a number of open fire cooking recipes, we would be delighted. It's mine and my husband's account. If I get just one extra follower each time I give a talk, he is really happy. He's a simple man. He's Welsh. And he would be very delighted if at least one of you follow that Instagram account today. Thank you very much.